Thank you all for coming. Um, this is a real important topic to myself as well as these wonderful panelists that are sitting here. Um, just a brief introduction. We welcome men. Please come. Um, Many of us in our careers have been supported, mentored, and championed by the men in our careers. And sometimes it's uh, the women, actually, that get in our way to succeed, which is kind of frustrating. We don't know why, but there's stats out in regard to that. Um, in introduction of this, we will be talking about that there is no cookie cutter approach to your career development within women in learning and development. There's uh, secrets to success that some of our panelists have had and that I've been fortunate enough to discuss um, in other conferences. This is a topic that has been highlighted, I would say, for the last five to six years in the US learning and development conferences. Um, and you might wonder, why is that? Well, the stats behind me pretty much explain that there is an issue with our career development as women in this field. Um, these stats come from the learning technologies folks here, the learning skills group. And they are one of the few learning specific stats in regard to women in this role. And I think that's really critical. So what it states is that we start out being the bulk of the population here in support roles. 68% are uh, females that are taking on these uh, coordinator, administrative support roles, and only 32% men. We then even out someplace in the middle. And it's really intriguing to see that at about the manager, mid-management level, men and women are pretty much equal in regard to what they're doing in their position. And that's kind of cool. So it shows that we've kind of, although we're the bulk of the population and we're the, we have that larger percentage in the administrative roles, we even it out. And then, sadly enough, and this is why um, we're having this discussion, it flips almost in the exact opposite direction. That those executives that are leading 66% are men, and this is no offense to men in business here. These stats are actually not as bad as some of the business stats of C-level executive women, but the flip is not acceptable, where we come in and we're a bulk of the population. In the United States, this is even worse. It's three to four times. We have a lot less men involved in this industry, and it still flips that um, it's almost 75% to 25% as far as who's in charge of the learning organizations. So we thought with that in mind, it's almost unacceptable that that can happen and that we're just going to ignore it. And therefore, the creation of this group and in all industries, that it became a topic that we really want to talk about. And I, you know, we feel this burning passion for it. Uh, a little background, there's a book, Lean In, Sheryl Sandberg, um, I, I'm more in the mindset of, although I love the fact that she brought it up and there's really some scary statistics that I don't even have to go into, but if you read those ladies, it gets even worse. Um, I almost want to think athletically of boxing out. You know, I want to have my team there. I want to pass the ball. I don't want to lean in and become part of it all. I want to create my own journey that you'll hear some of these ladies talk about and really forge ahead. Now, I'm doing this informal request here and study is, a number of women that have actually played a sport throughout their life. It doesn't have to be at an elite level. Is there any that have done that? Okay, just curious because in other forums that we've seen, a bulk of the women have had that experience and we just don't know if there's an alignment. There's some stats there showing that having some background with uh, teamwork or teams has been very beneficial for the C-level executive that are women. So with that in mind, I would like to take the opportunity with these stats here. And if you want further information, I'm going to stick around afterwards and I can direct you to where we have other stats too and get you some of that information if it's important to you. Um, but I'd like to go into the introduction of our panelists here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but we have Vinaz, Barbara, and Sarah. And we will ask them some thought-provoking questions to get the conversation started. I'm hoping that we spur a little fire here, we get some real uh, courageous conversation going, collect some of that, and then allow you in the last 15 or 20 minutes to ask them all questions. They will then leave you with a piece of advice that they've gained through their experience. Um, a neat thing that I like to say here, they're all from different industries, different layers, and really different levels of how they perceive success. And I think that's real critical. Many times you go into these sessions, they're very cookie cutter. Oh, we only have these industries, pharma, financial sectors, only this level showing. So this is a really um, awesome blend. Of, of positions and people here. So with that being said, Binaz. Welcome, my name is Binaz Çubukçu. Uh, I work in IKEA. Uh, IKEA Group is a big home furnishing retailer, as you might know. 
uh, I work as a learning design manager, one of the three managers throughout the whole IKEA companies. And today, when I was invited, I was really, really excited actually to be a part of this because it's been a journey. I'm Turkish, I live in Netherlands, I work in a global company, and I'm, I made my way up quite in a short time if you compare it with some other women. So uh, I thought this is a great opportunity to say, share some experiences and also hear from you. Great. great. Barbara? Um, Sharon, thank you for the introduction. Um, thrilled to be here. I hope this is part of an ongoing dialogue, by the way. Um, so Barbara Thompson, I work at BP. I see a couple of my colleagues here. Thank you. Um, so my role is learning performance consultant. Specifically what that means is that I help people to develop, connect and share um, using a range of learning technologies. The reason that I was thrilled to be approached by um, Don and Sharon about this event is why not? Um, it's great that it's part of a learning technologies conference and I think there are sort of two things that are burning for me which means that um, it should be part of an ongoing dialogue. One is that we realise that the, the rise of women in terms of um, purchasing and the role that they play there is significant. So for me, it's not just about l and it's not about businesses, but it's actually society and how we can um, take advantage of that. It makes no sense to me at all that we wouldn't have a diverse mix of people who'd be making decisions about women and, and the, the purchasing characteristics. So that's number one. And number two, I think many of us have discussed a shift in terms of L&D, a shift that's required to move us um, to have much more gritty conversations with the C-suite. And so it feels like quite a pivotal time to sort of tackle this topic as well. Okay. That's my take. Sarah Knaff, thank you. Hi, my name's Sarah Malone, uh, and I'm Head of Learning, Resourcing and Talent. I sometimes have to check that because I can never <laughs> remember which way around it goes. Learning, Resourcing and Talent at Post Office. Um, so I was really delighted to be asked, uh, specifically because uh, Post Office has for the first time become a Times um, Top 50 uh, employer for women, so it's something that we're really proud of, and we've put a lot of effort into really nurturing and helping women with careers with uh, female mentoring programmes, and it's just something that I'm incredibly passionate about, so I'm really delighted to be here. Great. So we thought we'd start this <coughs> off with almost how would you advise yourself at 20 years old, knowing what you know now, going into um, such a unique career development path here, knowing all the, the, the bad, the, the good, the you know, secrets of sauce there. How would you start? And I'm going to start with you, Sarah. Okay. So, um, so when I was 20, I was still at university. Um, I found I had a real passion for learning at university, actually I was incredibly curious, I think the lecturers got a bit bored of me kind of constantly knocking on doors and just wanting to know and, and being really hungry to learn. Um, I didn't actually start my first job till I was about 20, 22, 23, I was kind of a bit of an eternal student. Um, but what I found, I actually found that transition from, from university, from studying to the workplace quite difficult. So, so having been somebody who was quite happy to, you know, ask questions and I guess maybe in an environment where it was okay that you didn't know stuff and it was okay for you to fail, to move into the workplace where suddenly I'm in these meetings with all these people who've got sort of lots and lots of experience and I found, I kind of lost my voice a little bit, I would say. So you know those times when you're in a meeting and you think, oh, I should say this, and you don't say it, and then someone else says it, and then you kind of think, oh, why didn't I say it? So, so my advice to my 20-year-old self would be, uh, you know, be courageous, be, you know, speak out. Actually, um, you know, finding, finding the courage. People don't always know more than you, and you can contribute. I think, you know, to Barbara's point, actually, good business is about dialogue and about points of view, um, and, you know, I'm not sure whether or not my path would have been much different if I'd taken that advice, but it took me a while to kind of get over that nervousness about how do I contribute and, and everybody here knows much more than I do. So, um, yeah, be courageous. Great. Barbara? And conversely, I didn't uh, go through the typical academic background. My parents couldn't afford to send me to, to university. And um, unfortunately, that left a bit of a legacy in terms of imposter syndrome with me. Um, and the advice that I would sort of give myself as I reflect back on that now is that I took an unconventional route, uh, I think a route that served me quite well actually, and it will be no surprise to some of you who know me that there will be a sporting theme in this, so um, essentially my advice would be to observe basketball. Why? Because they traverse and pivot around obstacles quite, quite well. Um, there's not a, a very typical route to getting there, and they use lateral movement um, 
So that would be my advice. And there's boxing out too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sport Naz. Nellis is there. Vinaz? I, I think when I was 20, when you said I was studying, I was studying too when I was 20. Uh, but I, I knew what I wanted to do. And I think that that's a blessing. Not many people know what they want to become or who they are or what they are. And um, knowing it actually made me see the opportunities on hand and take advantage of those. Sometimes I didn't know how to handle those situations, such, such situations. And I would say, I, 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 w I would be so angry at those times when I felt <laughs> like, oh, why don't I know? I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to. And I would say, that's okay. That's okay. Just trust the process because as long as you trust in yourself, as, you, as long as you know what you want, it happens. And that, that would be one of the things that I would great. tell to my 20-year-old. Excellent. So. I, I thought that was a great reflection point kind of in our careers. In your current day, what one or two words would you want your organization or colleagues to reference you as? And I'm going to keep it to one or two words as much as possible so we can get through all our questions. So tough one. And I'm going to start with you, Barbara, because you're in the middle. They asked Barbara. me to mix it up just to you know, keep the moderator fresh, keep jumping around different <laughs> orders. Um, I would say inquisitive, being one of them, um, and that extends much more than the subject matter, but inquisitive and the individual and their backstory. And I'll also say playful. playful. Um, I think there's okay. something that um, supports creativity, being playful and open-minded. Perfect. Vanessa? Authentic. Be yourself. Uh, this is how I go to work. So I'm very well known for my dresses and my sneakers. So <laughs> if you like it, go for it. Um, and also political, we were talking yes. about it actually. Um, I, I, we all meet uh, higher people, senior managers, sometimes owners of the company to take the different discussions. I think that's one of the things that people know me for is that I know how to play the game. So they call it political. You're very political in our company, but I think that's knowing how to play the game and where to leave it a little bit to them <laughs> and where to say no or say, hmm, let's think about it. So I think those are the right. two things. And I'm sure we're going to pop back into that political component with some yep. of the other questions. Let's do that. Sarah? Uh, good stuff. Um, so I would say people would, would see me as being calm so it's a word that's quite often used, and, and I think actually that's really quite a helpful quality in terms of being able to, to kind of uh, facilitate in a very calm way and get to, get to the nub of the issue. Um, and uh, playful, fun, you know, it's kind of actually, I, li I like to have a bit of a laugh at work, you know, it's kind of, you're there for quite a long time, so who I work with is really important and, um, yeah, a bit of fun. Great. And stemming off of that, um, that's how you want others, that's how they perceive you. Uh, how important is that corporate culture and the organization itself in regard to your career development? How important is that? We'll start with Sarah. Um, so, so through my career, actually where I've worked has been a really, really important decision for me. So finding the right organization. So the, the people that I work with in the immediate team, but also um, flexibility is, is probably the key thing for me as a, as a you know, senior woman, um, and over the last um, 10, sort of 15 years in my career. So I've got, uh, you, I can't really call them a young family anymore. My girls are getting a, a little bit older now. But so I've been through the whole, you know, juggling nursery and school. And they are still at school, by the way. Um, they're just a little bit older now. But, um, you know, that difficulty of having a, um, a, you know, working husband, working mother, children. Mm -hmm. And so the organisation actually the organizations I've chosen to work with you know that's been incredibly important for me to be able to kind of still have a senior role but still feel that I have a life so um, culture wise I worked at BT for, for about five years and that was probably over a real pivotal time when my children were that age where I needed to kind of leave or attend um, you know plays and, and um, um, what's the word assemblies assemblies in the morning 
Uh, and, and that was fantastic, actually, because it was a global organisation. So it was 24 hours. So you kind of found that actually it was very acceptable to come in a bit late and work late and work in the evenings and be very flexible. And I found that really worked for me. So, you know, that's what I've looked for in jobs since then, because it's really, really important. Great. Work-life balance, that yeah. was a critical topic when we were speaking to prep. Barbara? So I found my visa changed over the years, actually, possibly in my sort of 20s, um, 30s, and perhaps I'm not going to say more than that because I'll show my age. Um, but I was looking for representation, so I'd look at corporate sites and see whether there was a woman at, you know, that had a seat at the table and all of those uh, good things. Um, that's shifted somewhat because I think uh, the reality is that there's not a wealth of companies that that have that, and I think it's more around seeing culture as more of the immediate, to your point, Sarah. So um, when you're interviewed, for me, I think that you can get the vibes of the, the hiring manager, um, and I'd want to understand kind of, you know, what their ethos is, how they think about development, not, you know, not just the atypical thing, how do they respect my voice, um, would I have a voice? So those are the things that have been much more important to me later on. Um, and I think sort of crucially, some of the environments that I've gone to work for have been ones that actually I wouldn't have thought that necessarily would have gone to work for. Um, but I think there's something around sometimes putting myself in sort of grittier, uh, grittier um, environments and try as, um, try as I might to try and affect change within. So that's been sort of part of my trajectory as well. Excellent. Excellent. And Dina? <coughs> I think uh, the... When you choose a company, it's like choosing a pair of gloves for you. Either they fit perfectly, sometimes they're a little bit too loose, but you, you're comfortable enough. Sometimes they're very tight, and you can't live with them. And being in a company is like that. That's how I see it. Sometimes you don't fit. So just stop the pain and leave. <laughs> I have that courage to leave because there will be another option for you out there. I think as women, we are warriors, but also warriors. And the worrying part kicks in, uh, in those times of, okay, what do I do? Shall I continue suffering or shall I just do something else? And I think that's one of the things that we should be courageous of. Um, and when it fits, you blossom uh, and it's, not only as a woman, but also as a person, and as a co-worker, or whatever you call it, as a colleague. And the, then the compatibility actually helps you cherish everything, but also nourish everything that you have within the organizational setup. And that <coughs> is something to look out for, I think. That's great, that's great. And that's actually echoed um, the CLO of Comcast, Matha Soren, had said the exact same thing in a panel similar to this, saying, know when to walk away. You know, and that's something that maybe as women we don't think is an option, but it's absolutely, if that glove is too tight, it's not worth the pain, right? No. Um, so we kind of wrap and we go into, uh, before we get to your questions, almost asking what does success look like to you? And that involves, um, was there a definite time where you saw a pinnacle movement within your career, role models, things like that? So I'm gonna start with you, Benaz, and just say, what does success look like to you? And I hope you all can take that in and reflect and say, wow, am I, am I at that point of success? And if I'm not, what do I need to do? If you're passionate about something and you're doing that something that you're passionate about, you're successful. This is what I say, and I won't say too much about it doing what you love, enjoying every minute of it, blood, sweat and tears included, I think is the best thing that you can ever achieve in your life, work-wise. And uh, the pinnacle moment, I think it is, every time I decided to leave a company, that's been the turning point for my life. And I moved a lot within IKEA as well, and everyone was like, oh, no. This is my life, this is my career choice, and I will take it. This is my decision. So standing by your decisions is also very important. Take it, go for it. If it works, how wonderful. If it doesn't, go for another one. Great, thank you. Barbara? Uh, I think I'm gonna start off with the role models and the pinnacle moments. Um, 
So predictably, I would say my mum, uh, for a variety of reasons, but um, she basically redefined her career in her 50s, which I think is kind of hugely powerful and I think is kind of instrumental in some of my makeup. Um, and Rosa Parks as well, by the way. Um, in terms of pinnacle moments, it's two actually. One, when a coach introduced me to the um, parent-child adult transactional model, it helped me understand much more crucially when I'm feeling um, in a particular way, in a particular scenario. I think that, that has been one of the, the kind of key models um, that I've been introduced to. And the second, second um, pinnacle moment was working at a company called CSE Consulting, um, which as the name suggests is a consulting firm. They, as part of the, um, part of the culture, they used to ask people to regularly contribute to efficiency and a range of other things. And I was an operations manager at that point, and I had a background working in recruitment, and I suggested to them that in order to mitigate our bench time, so people who weren't working on consulting projects, that we ascertained what people's secondary and third skill set is, we build a database, and then therefore we could resource projects, um, not just based on people's first skills. They asked me to come and head up that project. Um, and uh, it was just a really fantastic time, so I would say that that was. And in terms of success, um, like my previous answer, I think it means different things at different points in my career. I think um, success is definitely having a voice, and success for me is around less blurring about what I bring as a, as a person outside of the work and what I bring inside the work, so there's much more of a blurring of the lines. Great. Sarah? Um, so, so for me, I would say um, success equals being happy. So, you know, it's going to be different things for different people and it's going to be different at different points in your career. And, and I think, you know, I've always tried very hard to keep that balance of, you know, where my family is with my, you know, wanting to have a career and, and um, keeping interesting jobs. Um, and I, you know, I think I've been successful at, you know, every point, whether or not my job's been, you know, the biggest job or, or not, it's been right for me at that point. Um, I would say some of the pinnacle moments are those moments when perhaps you start getting that feeling that you're hungry for something else and you start to have that fear that goes, can I take any more on? Do I really want a bigger job? And, and you know, for, for, for me, actually, you know, BT, I talk about my BT experience. BT is a huge organisation. So, you know, actually, after a while, you sit there and you start to see peers, whether they're male or female, who start to progress and you start to think, actually, you know, may, maybe I'm a bit more hungry than, you know, I maybe like to admit. And keeping that balance is really important. But for me, the thing that really helped there was, um, was actually role models. So role models, um, you know, through my career, I, you know, there's, there's two or three, and they generally are people um, who have been either my boss or in, in some instances my boss's boss in previous jobs, but people who I felt have actually really managed to get that balance right. And I still now call them for advice when I'm, you know, sort of having a moment or, or thinking, you know, I can't, I can't do this. I can't kind of manage this job and, you know, family and all these other things that are going on. So that support network in those role, you know, in those role models and, and you know, with, with colleagues has been really, really important. And I have to say, actually, I think, you know, my, my defining moment absolutely was the first time that I said no to somebody quite senior about attending a meeting because there was an assembly and you know it was that sort of man this is either going to be really you know career limiting but actually what it did was it set the parameters for you know what I'm willing to do and not so I had quite an unusual work pattern at BT they you know they, they, they were brilliant um, but because my kids were quite little and my husband played guitar in a band, you know, kind of, as you do, aging cool. rock star, kind of, he used to go out and play guitar on a Friday night. So I would quite often work for four or five hours on a Friday night, which everybody thought was really, you know, kind of really unusual when they would see these emails coming. And I said, but it works for me, you know, so I'm, I'm you know, with the kids at the time when I need to be and then, you know, actually can crack through because nobody's bothering you at eight o'clock on a Friday night. You can get through <laughs> a lot of stuff. So, you know, so actually, you know, setting those parameters and being able to say, actually, you know, I'm, I am valuable and I do good stuff. And, you know, it's kind of actually, it, it's okay to do that on terms that work for both of us. That's great. That's great. And really what I, I really saw defined here in the UK and with these ladies is, let's not get caught up in what your title or, you know, what the successful path is. And that in the States, they do that too much. Uh, CLO, you know, they won't even ask you what success. It really is work-life balance. 
Where do you feel happy? Where do you feel successful? And I think that's, that's an area that's just cracking open within this topic is identifying what and how you see yourself as successful. With that being said, I would love to see if there's any questions that you may have. You can direct it to all three or a specific person on the panel and see if there's any questions and then we'll wrap up to make sure you make it to the next session in time. I see not many people are eating. Wow. <laughs> Did we intrigue you? I hope you didn't all skip lunch. <laughs> Thank you. All bought their sandwiches. I saw a few people. <laughs> so any, any questions out there? <coughs> sure, if you want to stand up and holler. Uh, do you have a mentor and do you think mental health is in your career? That's great. So to repeat the question, do you have a mentor and how do you see mentors helping you in your career? And I know we, we talked about, we had so many calls to prep for this, I think more out of enjoyment for me to learn so much from these ladies. So, um, well, maybe each of you briefly can kind of jump into that. Vanessa? I don't have a mentor. I get inspired by many different people and maybe they don't know, but they give something to me and I use that a lot. Barbara? So along similar lines, and, and I, it depends on the context, so at the moment I'm working with two people, um, so I do reverse mentoring, which I'm a big fan of, not least because of the space that I'm in, which is quite merging, so it would be quite nice to, to hear thoughts from other people. Um, and I'm currently working with someone uh, to, give, to help me sharpen my saw on a particular topic, so yeah, big fan of mentoring. Yes, so, so I'm quite, I have two actually, um, one who was a peer mentor, which I found incredibly useful, actually, and another woman in the workplace, so, you know, facing similar challenges. Um, and I guess I'd never really thought of it before until we just had this amazing conversation about six months ago, and I thought, wow, there's so much I can learn from you. You can really help me. So I kind of formally asked, and so, you know, we, we've got that relationship now, and I found that really, really helpful. Um, and then one who is a, an ex an ex-boss's boss who was somebody who I got on very well with. So it's probably more informal. Um, but again, you know, at those moments, there were just moments and I kind of, you know, give him a ring and say, and, and in fact, that's a, a, a chap, you know, give him a ring and say, can we meet for coffee? I could just do with a, a you know, a chat and some advice. So um, in, incredibly helpful. So we've, um, we, we've actually introduced a scheme in our organisation whereby we've sort of paired people and allowed them to, Great. you know, take that opportunity or not. So I'm um, mentoring a couple of ladies from our organisation, both of whom are a little older in their career. And one of them, you know, we, we started having this conversation and she said to me, I'm not really sure that I'm right for mentoring because I'm 50 and I'm not really sure that I want to come. <laughs> and by the end of the conversation, she was saying, I've got so much more to give, you know, it's kind of, can we do this again? And it's like, of course we can, you know, it's, it's, it's really important, so. That's excellent. And one thing I'm just gonna throw out there is I, through the years, have come to this event, January and in June. You may find mentors right amongst yourselves right mm. here and now. I've gained so much insight from an international perspective. I can't say that enough. One last other note that we did talk about, all three of us, is the importance of sponsor. Mm -hmm. And that's something that slipped by me in most mm -hmm. of my career, slipped by a number of us, is having that internal person that maybe is not your mentor, but is your champion. Yeah. So that you get a seat at the table and you have a presence. Um, we went, we talked quite a bit about that. So just, I'm, I'm laying that out there too. But for the next question, anything? Here. Yeah. Right up there and then we'll get to you later. So, uh, were you ever been in a situation where you have to think uh, whether to continue with the job or, or family? And if you had, what, what exactly you did? Super. I'm going to start with Sorry, Sarah and I'm going to... Repeat the question. Oh, repeat the question. Um, so, the decision between your job or your family. The balancing act. Ugh, yes. Um, we'll start with Sarah and we'll, we'll keep this to a couple of minutes each. Okay, yeah, so, um, so I've never had to face the situation of making that choice. So I've always, um, I've been very lucky though because I did work part-time for quite a while when my, you know, when my family were young. I've certainly wrestled with it. So, you know, as I said, you know, that defining moment, there's a point at which you kind of have to find, it's like the glove that, you know, actually I'm gonna fit here <laughs> or I'm idea. not, but actually, you know, these things are really important to me. And if this is the right organization, then I should be able to do both. So, uh, you know, I know it's not the case for, for everybody, but I, you know, I've made that a priority is to find uh, the organizations where I can have that work-life balance, where, you know, where I'm able to, to balance it. So, 
But, you know, I've, I've done it all. I've run from the station with my shoes in my hands to, you know, <laughs> go and collect the kids and been fined. And, um, you know, when we talk about supportive, we were talking about supportive networks on some of our earlier calls as well, as saying, actually, that's not just in the workplace. That's who can you phone to pick up kids or, you know, even to the extent where, you know, I've had friends around... Um, you know, bringing dinner or something, you know, because they, I'm having a really busy time and you don't want to fail at being a parent. But, you know, equally, you know, I think we probably all have, you know, real professional pride in what we do and it's a big part of, of, of who I am. So, that's sorry, great. I'm talking no, too much. No, that's keep great. My... I just remember spit up being on my shoulders oh, for like two years. Yeah. <laughs> I think people just thought it was a style for a while. We, we used to do the Weetabix check before work, <laughs> kind of, you know, yeah. quickly. So, um, Barbara? So I don't, I don't have children, so I don't know if I can answer your question um, to the degree you want, but I think there's something for me around just general work-life balance and the degree. I kind of see myself always going through like sort of peaks and troughs, and I actually I don't mind that, but there is a point where you can't carry on with the highs, and so you need to make sure that you work in an environment where there is a little bit of flex and give, and so sometimes I've taken decisions to leave on that basis. So it doesn't quite answer your question, but I think it gives you something. I don't have kids either, um, but two weeks before I had to leave Turkey for my new job, my father got a stroke and was very ill. And that was also a fa family matter. And then, of course, one starts thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? I mean, it's family, it's my father. Shall I leave him? What do I do? Shall I stay a little longer or whatever? But it's it's my life in the end. And of course, my new company said they would support me with whatever decision I make, and I don't have to uh, hurry or rush to move, and they will support me with whatever time I had. So I think that was very, very important. Without them knowing me, <coughs> really, um, it, it, it was great. I think that that was one of the things that I can relate to. I think that echoes to the organization. I hate to say it, but if you're being put in a corner regarding the choice of your family or your job, it may not be the right values and belief system in that organization. So, and I think we've all experienced that for personal mm -hmm. yeah. experiences. So I, that's a great, great question. We have room for one more question, and then we're going to have the ladies depart with their uh, word of advice to you all from their perspective. One more question. Oops. And, and we're going to be here afterwards to keep this conversation going, and hopefully we can get some sort of online forum and something, Donald, maybe, to keep it going. So he didn't know I was going to ask that. Thank you, ladies, for what you've shared. I just wanted to know, as you're part of large organizations, what do you or your organization do to empower women who work within the, the organization? Great. Empowerment. So, uh, Barbara, we'll start with you on this one. Sure. Um, so, we have a number of what we call business resources groups, which were initially set up um, just by you know well-intentioned people, and now they have business sponsorship. Um, and we do have, I think, probably about two or three that I'm aware of, uh, a women's group, where we have a range of topics, i.e., sort of mentoring, um, presenting yourself more powerfully, a, a range of different initiatives, but all in support of. Um, kind of business goals, so they're sort of not just a, a group of people coming together. So I'm a, um, a member of a number of those, and two of my colleagues are here as well. So they're, they've been really good forums. That's great. Sarah? Um, so, so I've already said we do um, formal mentoring for women, and we also have two um, annual events where we get about 100 or so um, middle and senior managers, uh, women together, but we cover, you know, like you say, uh, business mm -hmm. topics. So we may have some, you know, inspirational speakers, mm -hmm. but actually what we try and do is get a business challenge in there where, you know, we can show the, the, the power collectively of getting, uh, getting these women together. So we do mm -hmm. quite often use them for consumer type, mm -hmm. um, you know, buying, power you know we've had live customer focus groups where we then got you know the, the women in their tables to um, um you know we've set them challenging questions and that's really helped the business so it's um not doing it for the sake of you know tea and cake and a bit mm, of a chat mm. but you know but actually helping people to connect um you know getting those uh, relationships going but also then you know trying to generate something that's of use for the business mm -hmm. great it's very similar in ikea as well um, mentoring and coaching, of course, mm -hmm. and also we founded IKEA Women's Network, 
and this is its second year and that's very similar to what you're doing uh, middle to senior management women and men of course mm -hmm. uh, coming together and discussing business but also the role of women in the business and how we can support women to come more up to the mid and uh, especially the seniority levels that we want to. And I think that's a great question too because even as I was coming over and meeting with folks, um, my colleague who's somewhere out here was looking at gender diversity on some of the stuff. If your organization doesn't have it, I'm not saying go, it might be something that they would love to have but they need a champion. So I take this as a moment to encourage you all, even if your organization's smaller, to take that initiative because it's very rare. I've never heard of a, a large organization say it wasn't beneficial mm -hmm. having some sort of uh, women's empowerment group, yep. uh, however you might want to title it. Um, that is the last question. What I'd like to do to give you all time to kind of move into the next session is hear one word of advice from our ladies here. Welcome you to come if you have more conversations here. Um, this isn't a start and finish. Hopefully this is just the beginning and the, the room did fill up quite a bit. So I'm, I'm really excited by the interest that this, this conference is showing for it. So we'll start with Benaz, your piece of advice and departure to you all and to keep <coughs> the conversation moving along and, and continued. Love what you do. Stick with it as long as it makes you happy. And in times of trouble or in times of happiness, find someone to share it because that someone might be your sponsor. sponsor. Uh, and be confident. Great. Super, Barbara. I would say to take the same skills and the approach um, that you do within your projects to Project You. That's my little sound bite. Perfect. Sarah? Uh, so I would say probably the same thing I would say to my 20-year-old self, which is, you know, be courageous. And those moments when you think, oh, it's all too much, you know, make sure you've got a really good network around you and talk to someone because that's when, you know, sharing it gives you that little oomph that says actually you can. So, Excellent. Well, thank you all. I think this is a great start and um, I'm looking forward to continuing the dialogue with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.